Would you turn with me in your Bible to Romans chapter 8 and consider with me verses 28 and 29. Y'all don't mind if we get right to it, would you? Amen. Romans chapter 8, two verses, 28 and 29. From the New King James Version, this is what it says. And we know that all things work together for good. Those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. This is the word of God. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I want to say something this morning about the kingdom promise, the kingdom of people. The kingdom of promise. And, and it's my heart's desire that we, each one of us, those of us who are saved, will understand that we are citizens of another country, that our king is Jesus, and he is seated at the right hand of, of, of majesty on high, and we are his people, we are his children. So we are under the rule of a government that's out of this world, Amen. the kingdom of heaven. Romans chapter 8 uh, is a powerful chapter in the book of Romans, and it's designed to encourage us to understand uh, the spiritual transformation and the benefits that come with spiritual transformation. And it is a reminder that all of what we need, all of this change, the new life that has been given to us, comes through what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. And so, in order for us to understand Romans chapter 8, verse 28, which is claiming our attention this morning, we need to back up a little bit. Because the book of Romans, chapter 1 through 7, uh, say something about the process that God put in place to help us to arrive this morning at the position where we are. Amen. We have been redeemed. Amen. Amen. You got it. That, that we have sinned and we were separated from the king and the king. And the cause for re-entry was the life of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Y'all remember Adam and Eve got put out of the garden. Yeah. In the garden, God brought heaven and earth together. Man decided to rebel against God. And as a result of his rebellion, he was put out of the garden and separating himself from both the king and the king and the kingdom and so redemption to be redeemed was the price for re-entry that Jesus gave his life on the cross so that those of us who believe in faith will have an opportunity to re-enter we have been reconciled we've been redeemed we've been reconciled to God that because of Jesus did what he did when we put our faith in him we once again coexist with God garden before the fall humankind coexisted with God and when we sinned that harmony was interrupted because Jesus gave his life and we believe that he did it for us the harmony has been restored and we, once again, even right now, coexist with God. And then we are being restored into the image that was lost in the Garden of Eden. We were created in the image of God and after God's light. So our relationship with God, the intended relationship with God as an image bearer was that God's presence was manifested on earth through humankind. Y'all y'all getting this? Yes. That the plans and purposes of God that God intended for earth, he didn't want to come down and do it himself. He assigned humankind to do it. His throne is in heaven. 
and we are on earth. And it was God's intent to bring heaven to earth. So that you and I won't think we have to die to go to heaven. We can experience some kingdom benefits right now. Jesus has made it possible for you and I to be redeemed, to be reconciled, and we are being restored to the image that was lost in the garden. Romans chapter 1 through 7 outlines the actions of God. And you can read it. I know you have on occasion, but you can read it again. It outlines the actions of God and his redeeming and reconciliation and restoration. In chapter 8, verse 1, the first part of that section is a profound statement declaring our present condition with God. You want to know where you stand with God? Yes. It's in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, the 8th section. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation. That's where you stand with God. There is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ because Christ has given us new life. In Romans chapter 8, verse 10, it says, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. He who raised Christ from the dead has given life, has given life to your mortal body through his spirit who dwells in you. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Romans 8, 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Y'all, that's a benefit right there. Everybody can't talk to God like that. You got to be one of his children in order to address him like that. And in order to be one of his children, you have to have new life in you. So everybody in here in whom the Holy Spirit is dwelling, you are a child of God. And it is that spirit in you that connects with your human spirit that convinces you that you can say, Abba, Father, Dad. Romans chapter 8 verses 18 through 25 reminds us that even as sons and daughters of God, we live in a fallen world. That we are traveling through hazardous territory. You and I today, we live in a fallen world. We, we, and we still have some fallenness in us. That's why we are becoming the image is becoming. It's already began, but it has not completed. It's becoming. So you and I, chapter Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 25, reminds us that you and I, even as sons and daughters of the king, we are traveling through hazardous territory. That there's going to be some suffering in this world along the way. That, 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 there's, that, that you and I have to undergo some unpleasantries as we move through this world. We're going to have some broken hearts sometimes. We're going to be saddened by events that occur around us sometimes. We, we may be even, even ill. Each sickness might afflict us sometimes. As we travel through this hazardous territory, there is going to be suffering. But he says, don't trip on that. Because you got a helper. Amen. 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 Don't, 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 don't trip on your sickness, on your pain, on your suffering. Because this is the result of us moving through this, 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 this toxic territory. And, and the suffering that you experience here is like, you may not understand it right now, 
but it's light compared to the glory that God has planned for you. So, so if you can just, if you can just press your way through, come on now, come on, come on, come on. If you can just hang in there, if, if you can just, you can just pray your way through, and, and you are not on your own, because you got a helper. You got a, you got a divine helper. Who is God and who is from God. And that's the Holy Spirit who helps us in our weaknesses by interceding for the saints according to the will of God. Because the Spirit who knows the will of God knows exactly how to present our case before God even when we don't know how to pray. Amen. We pray for one thing because of the fallenness in us and the Holy Spirit is saying, that's okay, I'll take what you say and then I'll present it to God as it ought to be presented. Because I know the will of God, I know the end of your life, I know what you are going through right now, don't trip on that because we've got it all together. It's all in God's hands. So the Spirit knows exactly how to pray and because He knows how to pray, we got verse 28. Therefore, all things were together for good, but not just for anybody, but for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. That's a kingdom promise for kingdom people. Now, this, this doesn't apply. I'm, 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 I'm sorry and obligated to tell you <laughs> that this doesn't apply to you if you're not saved. Amen. For those of us who are parents, we have decided to give privileges to our children that other children can't enjoy. Now they can get some blessings, but there are some privileges that are reserved for our children because of the fact that they are our children. It's the same thing with God. Here is a principle that's reserved for God's children, and there are some general blessings and grace that God pours out on everybody. He allows his son to shine on the just and the unjust. The rain falls on saints and sinners. But here is a blessing that's reserved for his children. A kingdom blessing for kingdom people. All things work together for good for those who love God. Those who are called according to his purpose. So this is the verse that claims our attention today. This is a kingdom promise for kingdom people. And it's only for those who, who love God. Now there, what I want to do this morning is I want to show you three areas of your life where your love for God is demonstrated. Three areas of your life. And there are more, but I just, I have three this morning. Areas of your life where your love of God is demonstrated and the first area of your life where the love of God is demonstrated is in your worship. To worship means to bow down before God. It is the exercise of the human spirit that is di directed primarily toward God. And that's why when you come into the sanctuary, and I'm going to say something about that, to worship, you greet your neighbor, but your primary attention goes to God. It's humbling yourself before God and expressing his, the worthiness of God himself. Yo. Is pouring out of the self before God. See, and that's hard for some of us. Because sometimes we have developed, uh, 
we have developed a lifestyle where we, uh, we, we, we build around us a facade and, 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 and um, we, we put up a guard in society. And, and I get that. We put up a guard. And even in church, even when we are gathered in the assembly, we put on our best faces. And we tend to cover up yes. what's really going on in our lives. Yes. And if we could just keep it contained for about an hour, we could get in here and get out of here without ever being discovered by our neighbor. But when we go before God, in worship, we don't have to pretend. Lord have mercy. Don't have to put on airs because God already knows. So when you come into the sanctuary, when you come into the place that has been set aside for worship, you might as well go ahead on and expose your spirit before God. And let the Holy Ghost do some work on you while you're here rather than sitting closed up, bound up, covered up. Just let go and let God. Everybody in the house needs attention. Regardless of how well polished we might think we are, my path and 
and my mind down and you are acquainted with all of my ways. Y'all, that reflects the heart of worship. To worship begins in the heart of the believer. Yes. It begins in your heart. If it's not happening in your heart, it's not going to happen. Amen. Worship begins in the heart of the believer. We give, our, we give ourselves first to God. Yes. Then our attitude toward God is conformed by the Spirit's influence. Yes. You won't know how to worship if the Holy Ghost doesn't teach you. Yes. And then, as we mature, our thoughts toward God mature. And then our worship is expressed in our living and our giving. In the Old Testament, worship took place primarily at the temple, where the presence of God was known to be in the Holy of Holies. And so even today, Orthodox Jews face toward the east when they pray. And the reason they face toward the east is because that's where Solomon offered up the prayer when the first temple was completed. And that he said, God, whenever we turn to this place and pray, we want you to hear our voice. And God says, it's done deal. And so, and so the, the people of Israel would make a, a, a pilgrimage even in the even in the second and the Herod's temple period, they would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to get to the temple where the Holy of Holies were, and that's where they will worship. But now in the New Testament, because of what God has done for us, you are the temple. <laughs> you, 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 you have become the temple where the presence of God is in the holy place. And so, and so worship doesn't just have to happen in church. Worship happens wherever you are. Because the temple is you. And the presence of God resides there. So you don't have to turn to the east. All you have to do is turn to the inside. But Paul said, don't, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. Just because you're the temple doesn't mean you don't need to go to church. Matter of fact, Jesus demonstrates in his life, he went to the, to the synagogue on a regular basis. So don't tell me that you worship and that you go to the mountains and and you see the beauty of nature, and that's where you worship God, that's good. But even the creator of all that showed up. <laughs> In church. Worship. Worship. That, that, that's what Jesus was talking about when he explained to the woman the well. In Samaria, he said, he said, a true worshiper will worship God in spirit and in truth. And God is looking for those. For God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Amen. So, if you love God, it will be demonstrated in your worship. When you go through the storms of life, when you worship through, yes. The storms of life you demonstrating love and honor to God when you overcome obstacles calls that would obstruct your worship you are demonstrating your love for God when you overcome the temptations that would distract your worship then you are just demonstrating your love for God and when you do that you can be confident that all things work together for good those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Look, secondly, second, this, our love for God is demonstrated in our work. I didn't, you didn't expect that one. Did our love for God is demonstrated in our work. And that's true because you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good work, 
that he prepared in advance for you to walk in them. The word work is a verb and a noun. Work is what you, listen, here, here it is. Work is what you do with the spiritual gifts, time, talent, and resources that God gives to you. Write that down. Write that down. Work is not your job necessarily. Work is what you do with the spiritual gifts, time, talent, and resources that God gives to you. That's why Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. The night comes when no one can work. It's the same for us. So God's grace has saved you for a purpose. He has prepared you for a work and prepared a work for you. God has prepared you for a work and he has prepared a work for you. Everybody in here should be thankfully employed even if you don't have a job. <laughs> God has given a plan and purpose for every believer. Every believer is designed by God. You are God's workmanship. You are God's masterpiece. Specifically designed with a purpose in mind. And your purpose is revealed to you as you mature in Him. And your work is not stagnant. Your divine purpose changes with the seasons of your life and the circumstances of your life. You never outgrow your purpose. You never outgrow your work. As long as you are breathing, God has work for you to do. Your purpose is in flux. Your purpose is always in. While you were mother, perhaps single or single parents of multiple children, your primary purpose is providing for your children. That's your work. When your children get old and you become it next year, doesn't mean that you're through working. There's another purpose because that season is past you. Lord have mercy. Just because you are in your retirement years does not give you the right to stop your work. You may not have to punch in, but you still need to be on the job. Because God has work for you in every season of your life. And as you grow and mature in Him, you can comprehend in every season of your life the work that God has purpose for you to do. Somebody say amen. You glorify God through your work. So whatever you do, whatever your work or your J-O-B, the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly as unto the Lord and not like you working for people. No matter what your job may be, you bring the presence of God to it when you show up. God, God. been restored to the image of God and God is still working you but that image has been restored Amen. so when you show up God shows up Amen. when you show up you bring kingdom space with you listen 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 and I, I just Dorothy and I was talking about this last night and we were reflecting on our journey together uh, from the late 70s forward and what we discovered is that every place where we have lived or worked, we always left it better Amen. than we did when we found it. Amen. And that includes Union Baptist Church. Amen. Because, and that ought to happen in your life. Amen. The people who come into your sphere of influence ought to be blessed. Yes. If you deal with somebody and they bringing you down, you need to reconsider. If you if you are if you are interacting with somebody closely and there's no progress, 
no fruit bearing, yes. then you might want to take a step back and reconsider that relationship. Amen. Because when you show up with the kingdom, there ought to be some progress. Amen. Your job may pay, may not pay what you want it to pay, but if it's the best you can do right now, do it as unto the Lord. Even if you work in a hostile environment, you can glorify God by bringing kingdom space to that environment. They may not like you, but they can only do what God permits. And God knows how to prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemy. Your love for God is demonstrated with how you perform, how you show up for work. Amen. Go in prayed up with a forgiving spirit and watch what God does. Know that God is in control and watch what God does. Prepare yourself for advancement and when God gets ready to open the door, you can step right through the door. Amen. And even if they lay you off or if they fire you or if they close up shop because you are the king's daughter or the king's son, don't worry because all things work together for good for those who love God who are called according to his, to his purpose. Amen. This last one, I got a lot more to say, but I'm, I'm going to bring it in. I haven't talked to you in quite a while. <laughs> This last point. So our focus verse is Romans chapter 8 verse 28. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation. Yeah, all things think, all things work together for good. For all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. And we demonstrate our love for God in tangible ways in our worship, in our work, and in our witness. Amen. In our witness. Amen. Our love for God is demonstrated in our witness. The authority to witness, it comes from Jesus. In Matthew 28, he said, he said, go and tell somebody. The power and boldness to witness is given us result of the Holy Spirit at work in your heart power of God has come upon you and he has empowered your tongue to tell what God has done for you. But the willingness to witness is a decision that each one of you have to make. Amen. The message to share is the simple truth that God loves you. That God has restored you. That God's grace is upon you. That if it had not been for God in your life, yes. nothing that you have achieved could have been achieved. And nothing that you have endured could have been endured. But your witness is because God has the power to bring me through. That's why I'm here right now. That God loves you. That God, that Jesus saves us from our sin. That it, it's not because of my goodness, it's because of the goodness of God. It's not because I have earned anything, it's because of the grace of God. And I need to be the first one to tell you that if God did it for me, that God can certainly do it for you. Witness, your own testimony is the best witness you can share. And it's not just teaching from the Bible, y'all. You ain't got to know no Bible verses by heart in order to witness for God. All you got to do is tell what God has done for you. Come on now. Because when you look back in your life, you know God has done some things for you. Amen. It's just, you, can, you can say, I, I don't know any Bible verses right now, but my life is a product of the goodness of God. My, my life is a product of the goodness of God. I can tell you that God has done something awesome and something powerful in my personal life. He has lifted me from where I was. He has healed me from negative thinking and stinking thinking and bad attitudes and, and a negative outlook on 
sure of myself. He gives me strength when I get weak. He upholds me when I fall. And he 